rubbing up against the house, okay, underneath my bedroom. About 10 minutes later, my alarm goes off. I'm by myself, the dogs are barking, the gate bell has rung, somebody was down there, I hear noises, Ted's gone, I'm by myself. I look at my keypad, it says, motion detected, first floor. What do you think is going through my mind? Get your revolver. Right. <laughs> but calling 911 was not a top priority, although I did that. I called 911, okay? The alarm's going off. I got my gun. I was ready. Alarm's going off, and after about five or ten minutes, I don't know how long, the alarm eventually stopped. I reset it. Didn't hear anything. Okay, didn't see anything. I reset the alarm. About 20 minutes later, the alarm went off again. Motion detected, first floor. Called 911 again. Nothing. Reset the alarm, turned it on again. Finally, after about an hour and a half, waiting there, I have, um, I have this heroic studio in Jackson where I have a cappuccino bar. You know the story about cops who like to drink coffee? <laughs> well, I have some of the state troopers who come to my aerobic studio and get cappuccino all the time. So I called up these state trooper buddies I have, and I told them the situation. Look, I'm home by myself. Motion was detected on the first floor. Can you help me? From a state trooper, this is what he said. And, and in the meantime, I had called three times. I had called 911 three times. They kept saying they'll get somebody out. Okay? My state trooper buddy, state trooper buddy, you have to excuse me, I just got braces, so I <laughs> kind of have to talk. My friend said, I heard about what happened. I heard your alarms went off, but this is the night we all have to do paperwork. <laughs> we can't come out. <laughs> what do you think is going through my mind? Get the other gun. So, <laughs> yeah, we have this. Um, so, after talking to this guy, I said, I, I really need somebody to come out. He, he said, okay, okay, I'll come out myself. But don't tell anyone if they call you, if 911 calls you or you call them, don't tell them I'm on my way. I'll get in a lot of trouble. Don't tell them a cop's coming to help me. So the guy came out, him and his buddy came out, and they searched the premises outside of the house, inside of the house, looked in all the closets, ended up drawing on my cat, <laughs> found nothing, okay? To make a long story short, what happened there was fortunately a malfunction. We, we got the alarm company to come out and found out that there was a spider web over the motion detector, and every time a spider went over the motion detector, the alarm went off. <laughs> but meanwhile, that, that, that goes to show you how you can't rely on 911. Now, that's one situation. I know that there are many times where 911 is there. I know that. But in my situation, they weren't. I, cu I couldn't rely on them. So what do you do? Do you give up your right to own guns? Do you give up your right to protect yourself? Or should you empower yourself and learn how to protect yourself and your family? At the Queen of the Force Outdoor Education Program, we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about first aid and CPR, things you need to know. What happens if there's a natural disaster? Some, one of your kids or you break your arm. What do you do? How do you get your son out of the house that's burning? The Queen of the Forest Outdoor Education Program will be a three-day program at Sunrise Acres, which is a 300-acre fenced-in preserve with trophy white tail, and we have um, psychic deer and fallow deer and also wild boar. Now, there are rustic accommodations there, and I mean rustic. No running water, no electricity. But when I first met Ted, my idea of roughing it was going to a hotel with no room service. <laughs> so I, I really learned a lot. That's, that's all the roughing that I want to do. But we have, there's a whole local hotel that you can stay at also. But this is, a, this is an opportunity, and I'm so glad that you guys have invited me here today, and I'm so glad that you all showed up, because it shows me that we're all becoming aware that we can't rely on 911. You can only rely on one person. 
then that's you. And you really need to equip yourself and educate yourself with all the opportunities that you can and to empower yourself. It's about being in charge of your life. It's about being self-sufficient and independent. It's about being the queen of the forest in your own neck of the woods. Thank you very much. Jermaine, would you give your phone number on here for the uh, okay. queen of the forest? For the queen of the forest outdoor education program, you can call area code 517-750-4240 and um, it's scheduled for the weekend of September 12th, 13th, and 14th, although we might be adding another weekend. And I've got some information out there too, and some of Ted's zebra shirts. Thanks again. Thanks, Jemaine. Appreciate you being here. Sounds like a good time, doesn't it? A weekend in rustic accommodation. Go on. I'm with her on the room service thing, okay? Um, alrighty. Um, now, I have, I have to show you this. As I mentioned earlier, we uh, we had the class this afternoon with Paxton, and we had the beginning training yesterday, and the one in Free. And um, one of the things that we are making available here tonight, and to the ladies who took the class, is a couple of special t-shirts. This first one says, the way to a man's heart. <laughs> Straight through his chest. <laughs> One more. My favorite. I went to a test, an armed female, and all I got was the sex it wound. <laughs>
Sturgeon. She's an absolutely terrific woman. I've also had the opportunity to meet some of the other people in the community. Arlen Afton, who I've just found out is doing a, a marvelous job working with families, and I salute you. Thank you very much. And it's wonderful that I had a chance to meet Deb Wyman. There aren't too many women who are either on a state level or on a federal level who are so strongly involved with people's rights to own and bear arms. And I think she had to leave, but she certainly is a terrific person, and I hope that she'll be re-elected again in, a, in another office. As I said, I go around the country training women. I've been doing this for the last, well, I think, and this is my seventh year, and I've taught thousands upon thousands of, of women. And I want to kind of tell you the kind of women that I've been teaching. I would say that 90% of the women who I've taught used to be anti-gun. And they have decided to learn how to shoot a gun because, for a couple of reasons. One, because they realized that they wanted to be self-reliant, independent, and didn't want to rely on a husband, a father, significant other, or the police. But then there's a whole other group of women who are married to men who own guns. And I know that these men, for many, many years in some cases, have tried every which way to get their wives and daughters and mothers to learn how to shoot for self-defense because they feel very strongly about their women, that they want them to be able to protect themselves because they know they might not be there. And I want to publicly salute those men because those men have been some of the greatest supporters of women owning guns. And as a matter of fact, I do know that some of them are my best supporters. Uh, they've purchased my books sometimes a dozen at a time and not only give them to their wives and their daughters, but also give them to women associates who they work with, as well as other women friends. So I salute all the men in the audience today who have supported women who have gone out and learned how to shoot a handgun, as well as some cases shotguns, so thank you too. Los Angeles. I live in Hollywood land. And um, it's been very interesting for me to observe that over the years, people in the media are beginning to change their minds. I have a number of um, actresses who have taken my courses. And they haven't just taken it because they wanted to learn how to shoot a handgun so that they'd get a better part or whatever. They're taking the class because they want to be trained. They don't want to have a bodyguard. They don't want to rely on somebody else. I'm seeing more and more media people throughout the United States who are becoming less hostile to people like you out there. They're becoming less hostile to the idea of people owning guns to defend themselves. And it's becoming nicer and nicer to go out there and meet talk show hosts, both male and female, who are actually behind us. And it's important for you people to know that, that there are many, many people in the media. I'm talking television, I'm talking radio, and I'm talking 
newspapers. And oftentimes when you will get a television show where the talk show host will sound like they might be anti-gun, you should know that in many, many cases they aren't. And I found this out by, just by chance, when after the show, the talk show host, I'm talking male and female, would say to me, I'm behind what you're doing. I have a gun at home. And I would say, well, why are you, were you so tough on me? And they said, well, we've got to have an interesting show. So we've got to have both pro and con, and you know, I have to, you know, make it interesting. So I want you to know that there are people out there, and you'll be surprised to know who those people are who own guns and support the efforts that you are doing. But oftentimes, they are, shall we say, forced to be fair and we'll have to have the other side on. I'll just give you some examples. Um, I was profiled on 60 Minutes a number of years ago. And at first, it was gonna be just pro-gun. And then I got a call from the producer, and she said, I hope you don't mind, but um, we decided that we have to have Sarah Brady on. And I said, that's okay. She says, but I really want you to know that I support your efforts. And she said, I want you to know that Morley Safer, who was the, the man who did my show, he supports your efforts. I was also on CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Dan Rather is a good old boy from Texas. And uh, he supports your efforts. I can tell you that I could go on and on and on and tell you of people out there that have guns. Um, I was recently on the Rolanda show. Her show hasn't aired yet, but she happens to be pro-gun. And as a matter of fact, I was on that show with Roy Innes. I don't know if you know who Roy Innes is. He's head of CORE, Congress of Racial uh, Equality. He's an Afro-American, and he's a very strong pro-gun person. And it was real funny, we had on the show uh, a police officer, retired police officer, an Afro-American who was very anti-gun. And I'll tell you, Roy Innes went after him like nobody's business. And um, he actually said to uh, the police officer, what are you trying to do? take away the guns from the black community? We're losing our power as it is and you want us to go ahead and now not have guns? And he got up and he was standing up and, and really told this guy off and it, was, and it was really great to see it. And um, I look forward for that show to be aired. As I said, I could go on and on and tell you how many people in the media support you. And I know it gets real hard for you at times, continually going up to Lansing and talking to this person and that person. And um, it gets, I, I, I know it, it gets almost depressing at times because you think that you're not winning the battle. But I think sooner or later, and it might take another five years before you get your carry law passed here, but I do think that the tide is turning in the United States. I come from California, and boy, we've got it hard there. It might take 10 years. New York State might take 10 years. But I think as all of these state legislators see what's going on in other states, Florida, Texas, and we hear about the John Lott study, and the fact that he has shown that in those jurisdictions where there's a right to carry a handgun concealed, that homicide goes down, that burglary goes down, and that rape goes down. If we keep hammering away and show that just because you have a permit to carry law, that doesn't mean that the place becomes wild west. I mean, that's the thing they're always talking about. Oh, our, our city.
city, our state is going to become Wild West. But we all know that's not true. And so I salute each and every one of you for doing the work you're doing. And you've got, a, got some great organizations here in Michigan. And um, each and every one of you, I thank you for all of the other people who I've met who are out there trying to do the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of you out there. But I've got to tell you, you're real special. You're real special because I've gone to a lot of different states and met a lot of different people in various organizations. And I'm not, I'm really telling you the truth. You're, you're real good people and you're wor working hard and I look forward to, to coming back here and continue to work with you. And thank you so much for having me.
how to protect yourself for women if you're attacked. And it, you know, kept, and coming up next, how to protect yourself if you're attacked. And when they got to it, it was some local lady police officer who was suggesting that if you're grabbed from behind, you should step on his foot. And if you're grabbed from the front, you should punch him in the nose. Or maybe stick your fingers in his eyes. I didn't sleep very well that night. Because, of course, nowhere did they even remotely suggest that you should have a 38 in your pocket. And that that was the way to protect yourself. Or that you are three times more likely to survive an attack if you are armed. Don't be silly. Step on their foot. Punch them in the nose. Now perhaps it's a positive step. Perhaps, finally, they are beginning to suggest that we should indeed resist if we're attacked. I'm going to look at it that way. That rather than suggesting that we should just lie back and enjoy it, that it is time to resist. Because the next step to resisting, my friends, is to resist with a firearm. Indeed, two studies recently done, one out of Brandeis University and one of the National Mental Health Institute, showed clearly that the women who were most likely to be raped were the ones that didn't fight back. And we all know that if you are indeed attacked in this manner and you don't resist, and they're lucky enough to catch the guy, you're going to be victimized again by a court system and an attorney who, because you didn't resist, will suggest that you asked for it. So the weapons issue is a woman's issue. Now, those of you who were here for the, the prelude heard Dennis Gargan from MGO talk about the concerns of our opponents that having a, a citizenry that's armed will take us back to the days of the wild, wild west. Shootouts in the streets. Draw, partner. Most of us know that that whole Wild West scenario was a creation of fiction writers to glamorize what was really a, a pretty unglamorous time. Yes, the people were armed, but the shootout at the OK Corral, that was news because it was unusual, not because it was typical of the day. But what was typical of the day? Yeah, the folks were armed. And the women walking down the street did not need to fear for their lives. They knew. They had their weapons too. And they were just as capable of using them as the men. Now I'm not suggesting that we need to return to the days of the Wild West. Believe me, I, I like indoor plumbing. But nonetheless, the people were armed and the women were safe. Now, I, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about our, our good buddy Hugh McDermott from the Free Press that I get to say to him the things that a lot of us wish we could say. And in the course of dealing with him over those two articles that he wrote about us this week, invariably we wind up in a debate. You know, I, like I said, it's, not, it's my job to get him to cover us, and I don't think I'm ever going to change his mind. But I sure have a good time trying. And he said to me, you know, I don't know why you guys are so hopped up on this concealed carry issue. I don't understand why that's so important to you. I mean, I can understand defending the Constitution and that stuff, but I don't understand why you're willing to put yourselves out in front and be thought of as wackos because you want everybody to have the right to walk around with a gun. And I said to him, Hugh, the reason why we're willing to put ourselves out front is real simple. And it's about Dr. Iverson. You see, if Dr. Iverson would have come up from the back seat of that car where those punks pushed her with her purse, if she would have come up with a 38 out of that purse instead of a picture of her kids, She'd be having dinner with those kids tonight. And that's why we do it. As simple as that.
I don't want to be the next Dr. Iverson. And I don't want you to be the next Dr. Iverson. And I don't want you to be the next Dr. Iverson. That's why we're out there. Now, maybe she wouldn't have chosen to carry, but because I would, and because you would, and because you would, and because you would, she would have been safer. You see, I have a vision for Michigan, and it's just like what happened in Florida, and you know that concealed carry will come up again in 1997 or in 1998. It will come up again and again. Every woman in this audience, please sign your name, your address, your phone number, your email address if you have one. When the time comes to testify in Lansing, I will call you or I will drop you a postcard or I will send you an email. I will let you know and I want you to come back here to Lansing and I want you to sit up front and I want them to see all of the women who demand our right to defend ourselves and our children. Thank you.